Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie, brought to you by Killer Podcasts and Evergreen Podcasts Network. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre, and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Do you think the listener could hear my finger gun and wink that I get? <laughs> could they hear that in my voice? Do you think it was in... Infl- Certainly in your voice. An inflected finger gun. Mm, I think you always have one. Okay. <laughs> even <laughs> even when the physical finger gun isn't present? Mm-hmm. All right, I'll wear that like a, like a badge of honor. Hello to you and to the listener and to the dog barking upstairs. Caroline, uh, there's no other way to say this. To what do we owe the pleasure? <laughs> There's probably other ways to say that. Caroline, probably. what are we talking about this week? Well, this week's episode is going to be a bit of a spiritual companion to our show way back called Renaissance Poisons and Hygienic Horrors, which was episode number 29 of this podcast. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If we're going to do spiritual companions, <laughs> surely they should be for like haunting episodes. We're only going to confuse the listener. I think they'll get it, Sean. In that episode, we covered a variety of stories from poisoners of yore like Julia Tofana, to the affair of the poisons, to the fatal cosmetics used by Elizabeth I, to everything gross about the Renaissance era, like the year of the fistula, and the time that two noblewomen in a fancy opera box pooped onto the audience below instead of leaving the show for a bathroom break. Okay, desperately important business question. Do we have a Year of the Fistula t-shirt up and running yet? It's going up, I think. (laughs) This week, we're going to be talking about the kinds of medical quackery that made times of antiquity even more deadly than they needed to be, and the snake oil salesman that profited off the world's lack of medical knowledge. Uh, Profited, because that doesn't happen anymore? Uh, There's more regulations. (laughs) I felt like it was a good time to do this episode uh, because uh, the world around us right now is a bit of a difficult place to love a lot of the time, at least the last few years. And this is a nice reminder that while it may be frustrating to live in these times, the ones that came before were not any better in many, many ways. No, and they were much dirtier and much more fatal. Yes. Our main source for this story is the entertaining and educational book, Quackery, A Brief History of the Worst Ways to Cure Everything by Lydia Kang, M.D. and Nate Peterson. Yeah, and you were reading this and just uh, cackling to yourself over there, or or quackling. <laughs> yes. Sean, you got me this book for my birthday a while back because you knew how much I enjoyed The Royal Art of Poison by Eleanor Herman, and this is kind of a similar vibe, I have to say. Uh, good. Uh, then I then I bullseyed it. <laughs> you did. And uh, I and the listener get to profit from it now. So, you know, two birds. Well, let's begin. Uh, we start with the story of one famous doctor who was shockingly... Doctor who? <laughs> no. He was shockingly inept when it came to many of his medical beliefs, despite being very progressive in a lot of his others. This is the tale of Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of America's founding fathers, and proof that maybe those guys didn't have it all locked down back in the day, so maybe we should just keep on moving forward. Okay. (laughs) Benjamin Rush was born in Pennsylvania in 1746 and served as a proud delegate for Pennsylvania to the Continental Congress. Back home, he was a popular physician, politician, social reformer, humanitarian, educator, and even the founder of Dickinson College. He served as Surgeon General of the Continental Army and was a leader of the American Enlightenment, as well as an enthusiastic supporter of the American Revolution. You can spot his signature on the original Declaration of Independence right beneath Robert Morris and right above another Pennsylvania delegate, Benjamin Franklin. Okay. So good guy, and now you're going to tell me bad doctor? Well, okay. Still, it seems his heart was in the right place. So let's let's talk about the pros first. Well, yeah, until he had the surgeons get at it. (laughs) He opposed slavery. He improved education for women and advocated for a more enlightened penal system. 
He was committed to organizing medical knowledge around explanatory theories rather than just relying on empirical methods, and he became a professor of chemistry, medical theory, and clinical practice at the University of Pennsylvania. A real enlightenment man. Mm -hmm. Not only that, he was even referred to as the father of American psychiatry in 1965 by the American Psychiatric Association. Well, uh, our friend Tom Cruise would have some things to say about that, but uh, uh, I applaud it. Yeah, otherwise he seems like a pretty straight and narrow great guy, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, but you're, I, well, wait, no, I forgot what, what we were doing. Uh, you No, probably no. <laughs> well, he courted a lot of controversy over the years with his varied medical opinions, some of which can be recognized today as outright quackery. So let's take a look. Okay, but these are at least, you're saying, things that weren't, like, in vogue ideas at the time. There were some in vogue ideas, but I will let, you know, let our listeners know when these ideas are even being criticized by his contemporaries. So overall, his main theories seem to focus on Rush's idea that illness was the result of imbalances in the, fo- in the body's physical system, and these were caused by malfunctions in the brain. Okay, so the first part is kind of like how classical, like the Greeks thought about it, uh, yeah. right? Like humors? Yeah, we go into that later as well uh, when we talk about bloodletting. Um, but yeah, it's basically the body needs balance. He promoted a clean environment and the importance of personal and military hygiene, which was no doubt informed by his time encountering the horrors of the Revolutionary War. And military hygiene is when you just just beat all the dirty places <laughs> on your body with a with like a uh, a crop. Well, just like maybe wash your hands sometimes. <laughs> okay. But his other beliefs were not so standard. While he pioneered the humane treatment of psychiatric patients, which is good, he also unfortunately felt that mental illness could be best treated with a dose of calomel. Sean. Yes, darling. What's calomel, you ask? You know, I know that you did telepathically. Yes. Uh, I, I feel like it's either a um, an anti-itch cream for your feet developed by Johnson & Johnson in the 80s, or... It's like a fish oil? Well, calomel, not not those. Okay. Uh, it was named for the Greek words for good and black. And it was a popular medicine between the 16th and early 20th centuries that came as an odorless white powder. Why was it called the good black then? Well, it was good because it supposedly helped your health and black because that's the kind of bile it expelled. Oh, Just get it right out of there. Taken orally, it was a potent cathartic, a.k.a. it would empty out your guts in just about any direction it could manage. Oh, so it it wasn't, so like an emetic would be uh, something that makes you throw up, right? And a a laxative would be something that makes you... uh... This was everything, even (laughs) salivating. Oh, really? Yeah. Black? Among other things. Like, I think it was just an excess of salivation, but whatever came out the bottom was black, and they thought that was black bile and not just black stools. It was... Were, were the voms black? I'm not sure. I didn't get into the color of those. Why were they so specific <laughs> that it was only the... Anyway. I don't know. This is the Greeks. They're like, I don't know. It looks black to me. Calomel. Is that how old, the meta- how old calomel is? It was named for the Greek words of good and black. Okay. So what is contained in it is definitely older because it contained mercury. Of course, which is uh, exactly what Elizabeth was rubbing on her skin, right? To make it nice and white. And it's a metal we know today as being extremely damaging to the body, but which was used for centuries as a cure-all and makeup, as you mentioned, for just about anything and by just about everyone, including Napoleon Bonaparte, our boy Edgar Allan Poe, and even Little Women author Louisa May Alcott. Oh, great. And none of them went crazy. (laughs) Rush was aware of Mercury's existence within Calomel, writing, quote, Mercury acts in psychiatric disease by one, abstracting morbid excitement from the brain to the mouth, two, by removing visceral obstructions, and three, by changing the cause of our patient's complaints and fixing them wholly upon his sore mouth. By changing the cause of our patient's complaints, so because the mercury sucks so much? Mm Mm-hmm. The salivation will do more service if it excites some degree of resentment against the patient's physician or friends. (laughs) 
So Rush, as you said, is basically suggesting that ingesting calomel will suck so hard for these psychiatric patients that at the very least, it'll distract them. Well, and then they won't come back. He's, he's like, and then if they won't come back because they don't want more calumel, I mean, I guess you uh, technically cured them because they don't need a doctor anymore. Yeah, it'll make them focus on how much their mouths are now in pain, thanks to, which he didn't know. Thanks to. Heavy metal toxicity, which is also a great name for a system of a down album. Well, it's just a kind of a descriptor and then the title of a system of a down album. <laughs> Other side effects, according to quackery, could include mercurial erythism, which I think you mentioned as... Didn't you mention erythism? Sorry. Erythism? Sorry. I don't think what, I... What did you mention for vomiting? What was the word you used? Oh, emit... Uh, emit a, I, th- I think something that makes you throw up is called an emitic. Oh. Scratch that. Oh, and something that would prevent nausea or prevent you from vomiting is an anti-emitic. Other side effects, according to Quackery, could include mercurial erythism, which is a neurological disorder that includes depression, anxiety, pathological shyness, and frequent sighing. I feel like I sigh a lot. You're always asking me why I sigh, so maybe I have this. I was going to say, I was sort of (laughs) checking off the the boxes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not pathologically shy. Um, no, you're certainly not. I'm but just you, a little shy. You're, you're a homebody more than you're shy. I would say an introvert. And if that didn't catch on, there's always the possibility of limb tremors, known as Mad Hatter's disease, losing teeth, rotting jawbones, and gangrenous cheeks. So if you weren't mentally ill before, watching yourself rot in front of your very eyes would certainly do the trick. Or you could also be subjected to a cold water pour by the good doctor, where he attempted to establish governance over the deranged patients by dumping cold water down their coat sleeves. Yeah, but they're the deranged ones, Doc. (laughs) When mosquito-borne yellow fever hit Philadelphia in 1793, Rush transferred his passion for the use of calomel and psychiatric illness to its use in treating yellow fever, because why not? Um, was it a similar like? Well, if they if, if they listen, if their mouth sucks, they the fever will be fine. <laughs> I don't know what his strategy was here, but sometimes he'd employ ten times the usual dose of calomel, which led members of the Philadelphia College of Physicians to call his methods murderous and fit for a horse. What is calomel, or calumel, or however we're supposed to be saying? What is it supposed to do? I think it is supposed to make you shit and barf and that's supposed to be good for you oh right expelling black bile that's right okay (laughs) paired for uh, paired with his affection for bloodletting in this situation a method we'll talk more about later oh sure we what is he doing leeches or is he cutting people i think he was cutting um but i can't i can't disagree with with this assessment of him being a little murderous um he's definitely got an interesting touch he seems to want to scare his patients away Almost at any cost. Apparently, Rush would remove four to six pints of blood from a sufferer in a single day, thinking that this would help with symptoms. He didn't realize, however, that the average human male body only has about 12 pints of blood total. This is amazing. How many did he kill any patients? We're getting there. <laughs> he would do this often for several days in a row. And it's said that the height at the height of the epidemic that his front lawn in Philadelphia had so much congealed blood splashed across it that it stank and buzzed with flies. No, he's a Call yeah. of Cthulhu villain. <laughs> One critic stated, the times are ominous indeed when quack to quack <laughs> cries purge with blood. He is, this doctor is an omen. <laughs> At this point, Thomas Jefferson himself estimated the fatality rate of Philly's yellow fever at 33%. But in 1960, the fatality rate of Russia's patients, as you just asked, at this same time was found to be 46%. Oh, so yeah. So uh, he he wasn't like convicted of murdering any of them, but he no, probably but caused some deaths. Seeing him for treatment was literally more deadly than not. Our boy Alexander Hamilton even became ill with the fever during this time. And said, just please don't bring me to Jeffrey. (laughs) Even he wouldn't turn to his old friend, Dr. Rush, for help. He wrote, in his theory of bleeding and mercury, I was ever opposed to my friend. 
whom I greatly loved, but who had done much harm in the sincerest persuasion that he was preserving life. Okay, so listen, <laughs> Hamilton thinks the guy's on the level, though. He's a good he's a good guy, but it's like, you know, being friends with someone whose po- political beliefs, like, you're just not. He's like, eh, he's a good guy, but eesh, you know? Yeah, no, if the doctor's politics were, ba- were bad at it, Hamilton, Hamilton would be different. Would yes. not have been friends with him. <laughs> Rush did eventually help to contribute to the end of the epidemic, at least, as his passion for sanitation helped improve Philadelphia's standing water problem, which, of course, how, uh, was the thing that was kind of spreading this because it was spread by mosquitoes. But it also happened to be around the time of the first autumn frost, which killed a lot of the mosquitoes. But it's the thought that counts. <laughs> For the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1803, Thomas Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis to Rush to learn about illnesses and bloodletting, and and Rush provided the group with a medikit that included Turkish opium for nervousness, emetics, possibly calomel, to induce (laughs) vomiting, medicinal wine, and 50 dozen of his signature Dr. Rush's bilious pills, which were laxatives containing more than 50% mercury. Oh, I love this. And he's what, selling these out of the back of like a well, lime he gave green these. cart? He gave these to the expedition. He was very, very giving. No, I know. But when you, I picture like a little oh. little packaging. Of, you're you're picturing Dr. Or not, um, Dr. McGillicuddy. Mr. Pirelli from Sweeney Todd. Essentially, yes. <laughs> yes. And he's, he's, he's selling his little bilious bilious pills <laughs> so uh, these... was jefferson trying to murder the clark expedition no he still believed in in his friend rush they were still all very close it's kind of like a college fraternity they they all stayed very close unless their politics got in the way which we saw that happen now the bilious pills has actually funnily enough to help provide archaeologists with a means to accurately trace the path the expedition took to the pacific because they were undigestible? Well, due to the Corps' meat-rich diet and lack of clean water, the members of the crew used the pills quite often because I guess they wanted to get it all out. You know, whether they were effective or not in letting them do anything else, you know, make them feel any better. At least they were an effective laxative. Because there were so much mercury in the pills historians can literally just track the sites of the expedition's shits across the country just with a metal detector like at the beach (laughs) (laughs) i don't know how they they do it that way but yeah you can chart the lewis and clark expedition by poop because of dr benjamin rush that's that's incredible this has been your ain't it scary weird historical poop fact of the episode It's unclear what exactly was the last straw, but eventually Rush's private medical practice had completely dwindled by around this time as well. Probably for the best. Uh, yeah, and, and we can obviously sort of see why. <laughs> why. Some believe that Rush's penchant for bloodletting hastened the death of Benjamin Franklin and possibly even George Washington, as one of Washington's medics was Rush's former student. And he died from lack of blood. <laughs> It wasn't all bad, though. He was the one who helped reconcile the friendship that had been broken between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams before their deaths, which produced some invaluable letters precious to American history. (laughs) He was the go-between. All right. He was the go-between. And, you know, that's we we get that fun, like... um, 20 years of them being besties again. Yeah. And and again, great letters. And we get that fun... um, Thomas Thomas Jefferson still lives. John Adams still lives, and they're both dying. Yeah. Oh, it was Jefferson who said John Adams still lives? I think they both were like... I, I, I don't think they both said it. <laughs> they were both talking about each other when they were dying. Yeah. Because they're... Uh, well, anyway, I was going to talk about Star Wars. <laughs> um. Rush himself eventually died of typhus on July 7th, 1848, 174 years ago, exactly from the day this episode comes out. So funny how that always happens. I feel like we always drop an episode and there's like a date in it that has to do with when we're dropping the episode. And this is when Benjamin Rush died of typhus? Yes. Okay. 174 years ago. Did he try any self-treatment or anything like that? Sean, lest you claim the man was a hypocrite, he too requested bloodletting before his death to treat his deadly fever. Did he request calumel? 
I'm not sure. I just knew that he did the bloodletting. Gonna guess he did not. <laughs> As I said before, it seems Rush did have his heart in the right place and had a very and had a lot of very admirable views, especially for those of the times, and even for a founding father. He was an abolitionist, he believed in social justice, humanized the mentally ill and the incarcerated, and promoted medical freedom. Unfortunately, he was a little too free, often, with his own medical beliefs. Well, a little too free with the mercury and with his patient's blood, (laughs) certainly. Um, I just love the idea that, like, yeah, and then it sucks so much, they just don't want to come back. Yeah. Next, we move on from the buttoned-up story of a doctor founding father to something a little more loose, a little more fun. You don't you didn't think Benjamin was loose? Well, this is a little more sexy. <gasps> you mean is this ain't it scary after dark? Ain't it sexy? <laughs> oh no. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's our only fans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, just a disclaimer that is not our only fans. <laughs> no, we only have Patreon and we keep our clothes on. But it is time for some sexy quackery up in here. And yeah, it's not Patreon. <laughs> and boy, is there plenty of it. And there's plenty of it today. I mean, you kind of mentioned that quackery is still around. You just look around the internet. There's pills and pumps promising to lengthen inadequate members, horny goat weed and bodegas promising to boost libido, spam emails claiming that they have the secret to all that crazy tantric sex sting claims to be doing. Okay, you're right. This is pretty sexy. (laughs) Sex is humanity's great obsession, and that obsession has always ventured into desperation to solve problems (laughs) and cure ills, among other things. Sure. It's, it's uh, uh, many people would say, the most, the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it's one thing that we can really look to to humanize our ancestors. Everyone has been obsessed with P's, V's, and B's since the dawn of time. Some things never change. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Roman graffiti, right? It's all mm-hmm. um, uh, dicks and balls. Mm-hmm. But thankfully, the way we treat certain things has changed, but let's see how we used to. The concept of hysteria is one we've touched on, hardy har, touched on, (laughs) in uh, previous episodes, especially in show number 42, aptly titled Hysterias. Ah, yes. Fun episode. Mm -hmm. But there was another kind of hysteria afoot in history, and it often centered upon women. Hippocrates of Kos, K-O-S, a Greek physician in the classical period who is considered one of the biggest figures in the history of medicine and is called literally the father of medicine. Yeah, the Hippocratic Oath and all that. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of strange and interesting theories that were handed down for hundreds upon hundreds of years before finally being proven or disproven. One of these was his theory of hysteria, where he felt that a woman's wandering uterus could be the root of all her health problems and that they would that they could cure a whole host of their illnesses through having sex. Um, as long as they were married, of course. Their uterus is... Did the Greeks care if they were married? Yes. Well, he did. Was the uterus wandering around literally the body? He thought so. I don't know. I know mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs> the Victorian... Well, how, do you, how do you know? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> the Victorians took this idea one step further, though I'm not sure they quite realized what they were doing. In this era, women were repeatedly diagnosed with hysteria for just about any reason, including fatigue, anxiety, or mild depression. So like, oh, she can't be a happy, bored and competent and complacent housewife? She must be hysterical. Uh In the second half of the 19th century, something had to be done about this epidemic of female depression which to me was completely and utterly an understandable issue. Uh, well, we, we, we could just give them jobs and uh, purposes of their own. <laughs> yeah, I know I would have been depressed too, probably, unless maybe I was like one of the handful of women that were just allowed to be novelists or whatever. <laughs> it's like three people. Uh, Dr. Russell Trawl took the hysteria by the horns and began recommending a pelvic massage that was vigorous enough to eventually induce a hysterical paroxysm. 
What does that mean exactly? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to guess that it means orgasm, Carrie. It means diddle a lady till she has an orgasm. That'll make her happy. <laughs> well. And you know what? I could imagine why. Men of those times, and sadly we know many men even today, didn't generally care whether women experienced sexual pleasure or uh, happiness of any sort. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly sexual pleasure. <laughs> Their duty was to bear children, rinse and repeat. For those with a well, touch... and wash, too. You gotta wash and then rinse the Oh, dishes. mother the children, of course. Um, for those with a touch of depression or anxiety that were able to experience this new pelvic massage, I'm sure actually receiving pleasure was an absolute revelation. It wasn't a sexy act for the doctors performing it, though. Are you sure? Yeah. As Quackery states... They were kind of annoyed at having to do them at all. Doctors complained that the correct technique was very difficult to learn and was time-consuming to boot. Some exhausted physicians reported a pelvic massage took about an hour to successfully perform and led to cases of wrist ache. Uh, I mean, you could just get good, though. <laughs> yeah, these dudes were even trained for it, and they're taking forever. <laughs> if you're t you're taking an hour on uh, to, to finger a lady, and you're telling me that that. Uh... You're not enjoying it? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, remember, these guys needed training to even do this. I'm just, it seems like they're taking their time is all. I doubt 99% of the other men in the world were taking any sort of time to figure that shit out. So, at least they're devoted to their craft. Yeah. <laughs> this act exhausted these poor MDs so much that they had to come with a more automatic way of distributing pelvic massages. Again, they weren't enjoying doing this for so long because they invented, in the late 19th century, the electromechanical vibrator. Th that was invented for this purpose? To replace their hands, yes, because their wrists were getting tired. Created by Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville, these little wonders reduce massage time from one tiring hour to five paroxysmic minutes. <laughs> paroxysmic minutes. Paroxysmic? Paroxysmic. Paroxysm. Paroxysmic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure the ladies left the office smiling and satisfied. Now, was it these women's choice to have this procedure done? I think often the husband would say she's hysterical and, and force her to go to the doctor. And then they'd get this procedure and be like, all right, I feel, I'm feeling a little depressed today. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to the doctor. <laughs> Eventually, these gadgets moved from the doctor's office to the home. And the modern woman could order, order her very own personal vibrator right out of the Sears catalog for a few bucks. Uh, did they call them massagers or something? Uh, they called them like vibrators or vibrating machines, but they didn't have the same sort of thing that they do today. Like when you say vibrator, it's very sexual, but back in the day, it wasn't. Okay. They sure, it's a medical <laughs> procedure. Mm -hmm. They became so popular, in fact, that they were the fifth electrical appliance introduced to the home. You have to. Well, yeah, sure. After you get your um, flashlight and, <laughs> no, and your like television. No, it was like toaster, tea kettle, vibrator. <laughs> uh, they were that essential. And again, with patriarchal beliefs of the day, I could understand why. Advertisements carefully omitted any reference to sexual pleasure, stating things like, quote, the secret of the ages has been discovered in vibration. Great scientists tell us that we owe not only our health, but even our life strength to this wonderful force. Vibration promotes life and vigor, strength and beauty. Vibrate your body and make it well. You have no right to be sick. It, you have no right to be sick. Mm -hmm. I, I love how we haven't... <laughs> Even when it's like, here's something for women, it's like, because you have no right to be sick. Well, especially uh, patriarchal, uh, thanks to some very instructional films from the 1920s, the secret fun of the pelvic massage became known to the masses and home vibrators became taboo. No more Sears orders. Because God forbid women enjoy pleasure. That would be just awful. Well, but also now we have all these hysterical women running around. Mm -hmm. But they didn't care in the 1920s. They were like, oh, well, 
I don't know. <laughs> speaking of not allowing the enjoying speaking of a not allowing the enjoyment of pleasure, have you met John Harvey Kellogg? Uh wait, uh the, the he of the cornflakes? Yes. You, I love this guy. You've uh You've certainly met his products. Uh, Kellogg, along with his brother Will, created the breakfast cereal Kellogg's Corn Flakes, which originated the whole Kellogg brand. But let's get to those dry bits of no fun in a minute. And that's exactly what they're <laughs> supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. John Harvey Kellogg was a doctor, nutritionist, inventor, health activist, businessman, and, uh-oh, eugenicist. <laughs> who lived between the mid-1800s and mid-1900s. And a very devout Christian, right? Mm -hmm. he, he founded the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, which combined aspects of a European spa, hydrotherapy, hospital, and hotel into one destination. He is sort of parodied in the middling uh, Matthew Broderick movie, The Road to Wellville. Yes. Kellogg was all about healthy eating and weight maintenance and touted the benefits of exercise, calorie, re calorie restriction, vegetarianism, and abstinence from alcohol and tobacco. So it seems reasonable enough so far for a health guy, right? Yep, these all seem like solid recommendations, if maybe a little stringent for the, for the, uh, for the average Joe. Well, he also vehemently opposed the concept of masturbation. Um... Yeah. Kellogg was obsessed with the idea that a little she or he bop was the literal <laughs> unhealthiest thing you could do for your mind, body, and soul, deeming it self-abuse. Because he felt... He, did he invent that term? Uh, he, he regularly used it. I'm sure he didn't invent it. Because he felt gluttony was fatal to his idea of chastity, he wanted to invent something so bland and so tasteless that all thoughts of pleasure and sex would be dri driven from your mind. So the idea is like eating flavorful, eating flavorful food is going to make you horny? Yes. And he, he said you shouldn't eat pickles, you shouldn't have spices, uh, rich meats and wine. All of that will make you horny. And so like buffalo wings are a are horny. An they're an aphrodisiac. Anything with flavor will the make you horny. The hotter the sexier. <laughs> Enter Sylvester Graham, who in 1829 invented graham crackers from white bread devoid of nutrients and additives. God, you know what will make anything sexier is just dumping some hot nacho cheese right on top of it. It's, it's, it's going to make you horny. Sorry. Now, Kellogg took Graham's idea and ran with it, and Kellogg's cornflakes were born. Folks, this is literally true. That is where this cereal comes from. It's yeah. so you stop jerking off. Yes, they're made to be flavorless and boring so that you <laughs> won't jerk off after you eat them. Yes, so think about that the next time you enjoy a big old bowl with your morning OJ. We'll learn more about snake oil salesmen, weird science, and more quacks than a duck pond after the break. More quacks than a duck pond. Caroline. Ohio is a land of mystery. From missing shipwrecks and lost treasure beneath her surface to strange phenomenon slicing through her skies. From myths that have evolved around historic events and people to the unsolved murders and disappearances that keep her communities wondering what happened. Find Ohio Mysteries on your favorite podcast app and let's explore the inexplicable. OhioMysteries.com We're back. Uh, when in the first half of this podcast, in the A block industry <laughs> term, we were talking about what seemed to me like sincerely held um, quack medical beliefs, things mm -hmm. that people really thought were helping people. Um, but you said that in this back half here, Carrie, in the back nine uh, golf term, we were going to get into <laughs> some. You're really mixing your metaphors here. We were going to get into uh, a, a mixed bag, if you. I'm not going to mix the metaphors. <laughs> the fourth <laughs> metaphor in this sentence? Snake oil salesman. We're going to get into some actual honest-to-God con artists here. 
Yes, we've talked about a couple of doctors, one who seemed to have good intentions, one who would absolutely suck at a party. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And now we're going to take a trip down Shady Lane and investigate the strange world of snake oil salesmen and their wares. Hmm. Since the dawn of time, remedies and poultices have been produced and sold for those desperate enough to want a fix. And many of those creating these concoctions were very, very far from the medical profession, not like being a doctor was always helpful in these cases, as we've so far seen, but mm-hmm. still... Sure, you got your potions to restore your hit points. You got potions (laughs) to restore your magic points. Here are some of my favorite frauds. Now, you've undoubtedly heard the term snake oil salesman before this podcast, but did you know it was referring to an actual person and his product? Oh, snake oil? Mm Mm-hmm. The original snake oil salesman, TM, was named Clark Stanley, and he sold the aptly named Clark Stanley's Snake Oil Liniment. But you can call me Clark the Snake, hey. <laughs> this liniment was inspired by the traditional Chinese medicine made from the fat of Chinese water snakes, which was used in the 1800s in the American West by immigrant laborers to relieve pain, reduce inflammation, and treat arthritis. Ancient Chinese secret. <laughs> Basically. Um, this Chinese snake snake oil was high in omega-3 fatty acids, which made it an actual effective anti-inflammatory, like they were doing something right there. Stanley Clark took this idea and created what his advertisement claimed to be the strongest and best liniment known for pain and lameness. Yeah, juice real snakes to get every bottle. (laughs) (laughs) You sound like Beetlejuice. Yeah, I'm wearing snake skin. (laughs) Clark's snake oil promised to ease rheumatism, sciatica, toothache, sprains, frostbite, bruises, sore throat, animal bites, and more. Yes, the thing will make your lady hornier than a plate of (laughs) buffalo wings. (laughs) Well, the problem was it didn't include any of the real-life snake oil that gave the Chinese version its actual anti-inflammatory properties. Clark's version was concocted from mineral oil, beef fat, red pepper, and turpentine. Piss and ink, (laughs) as Sweeney Todd would say. Many purchased the liniment from druggists and at fairs before an official inquiry revealed that they'd all been duped. Sean, remember calomel? Uh, Yes, of course (laughs) I do. Uh, It was, uh, it sounds like just a... Mercury and, like, white dye? Or just mercury, maybe? Stuff, yeah. Dr. Moffat's Tithina powder, teeth, I-N-A, powder. Wait, wait, this is the stuff that you put on, like, a falafel? (laughs) No. It was full of calomel, though, and it promised to strengthen the child, relieve the bowel troubles of children of any age, and intriguingly, make baby fat as a pig. Make baby fat as a pig? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Unfortunately, thanks to the mercury content... Here, take this if you want to uh, cure colic, or um, if you if, if the baby's running a fever. Uh, or, I'm pretty sure the advertisement has the baby looking like a pig, too, in it. Or to make baby as fat as a pig. <laughs> uh, thanks to the mercury Don't content... Don't we love it, folks? Don't we love it when baby is as fat <laughs> as a pig? Many children would get wildly sick from the stuff, and the cause wasn't understood until the 1950s. That's how late this stuff was being used. The tahini powder? <laughs> Tathena. Tathena McCabe. Hmm. Oh, that's not bad. Speaking of mercury, we have another American president on deck. During the 1850s, while a pre-presidential Abraham Lincoln was suffering from mood swings, headaches, and constipation, he began taking what were called blue pills. These were peppercorn-sized pills containing pure liquid mercury, licorice root, rose water, honey, and sugar. I thought it was just a very liberal subreddit. (laughs) Unfortunately, these blue pills did not help Lincoln, but rather worsened his, his symptoms and likely contributed to his reported volatile behavior during this time, which, uh included bouts of depression mixed with rage, insomnia, tremors, and gait problems, all likely due to mercury toxicity. G-A-I-T? Mm-hmm. Gait problems? Yeah, like walking. Oh, and he was a he was a tall guy, so <laughs> yeah. you, don't, you don't want that, guy, that thing swaying around. Yeah, you don't want him wobbling around. Um, but I bet all of this helped him in the ring, 
in the wrestling ring where he had a 301 <laughs> uh, lifetime record. Maybe so, but thankfully he kicked the pills once he was elected, which is for the best because I'm not sure a drug-addicted rage beast Abraham Lincoln would have been the best thing during the difficult times of the American Civil War. Is that um is that what goes on in the that vampire hunter one? <laughs> maybe, maybe he's still on the blue pills and that's why he's so good at killing vampires. Or all the vampires are a hallucination. What if at the end mm. that book's just about Abraham Lincoln like going on a, a hallucinatory massacre rampage? What if at the end we're the monster at the end of this book? Don't uh, don't scare me like Elmo <laughs> did that time. You know that's a Mandela effect. Anyway, we'll talk about that. When oh, we talk yeah, about yes, Mandela no, effect. we've talked about this. Yes, the monster <laughs> at the end of the book is Elmo. Well, it's supposed to. It's, it's you, and it has a little no. There's a different, mirror. There's yes. a different book where where there's a mirror no, at the end. No, it's the monster at the end of the, the book. monster at the end I'm, of I'm the, the book. monster. And I'm sorry, it wasn't Elmo. It was Grover. Grover's terrified. He's a comedy character. He's <laughs> terrified of the monster at the end of the book. Turns out it's Grover. Uh, This has nothing to do with medical quackery. (laughs) Let's get back. Mrs. Moffat, maybe she's married to Dr. Moffat of the Tathena powder. Or Stephen Moffat of the doctor. (laughs) Mrs. Moffat's shoe fly powders for drunkenness. Shoe fly, don't bother me. (laughs) Were popular for treating alcoholism until 1941, when a court case surrounding the product revealed that it contained antimony, a toxic metal which, like mercury, caused the product's signature vomitous reaction. Okay, but did it make people stop drinking? I guess some, because antimony is crazily still used outside of the U.S. to cure alcoholism, with a case being reported in the New England Journal of Medicine as recently as 2012. Really? So what do they do? They just, every time you drink, you just also drink something that makes you horribly throw up? No, I don't know what the idea is there. Arsenic is a well-known poison nowadays, but it seems back in the day there wasn't the same kind of certainty. Since it causes the skin surface to to die and drop off, light topical use for things like psoriasis were effective, but excessive use could cause chronic arsenic toxicity. That didn't stop a variety of quack medicines from employing the stuff, like Aiken's tonic pills, uh, compound sulfur lozenges, Gross's neuralgia pills. So many, these are all uh, oral medicines. Mm -hmm. And anti-malarials like tasteless ague and fever drops. Like even, okay, so what we know about arsenic is if you rub it on a part of your skin where we want the skin to die and fall off, that happens. So why don't you eat it? Too much, your real skin falls (laughs) off. Let's eat this. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. (laughs) Dr. Thomas Fowler, uh, not a snake oil man, but he may as well be made the popular Fowler's Solution in 1786, which contained 1% potassium arsenate and also some lavender flavoring added to prevent it from being mistaken for regular water. Well, the lavender sounds quite nice. Yes. It claimed to cure syphilis, parasitic infections, and fevers. It was even applied to some skin tumors with the hopes of dissolving them. Despite being called capricious, unpredictable and uncontrollable both as to good and harm in a 1948 pharmacology texts luminaries like Karl Marx and Charles Darwin continued using Fowler's with the latter so devoted to the product that he is believed to have suffered from arsenic poisoning. Wow. And Darwin managed to pass along his genes, which in a way disproves his own theory. (laughs) Next we have colloidal silver. Does this bit of snake oil ring a bell? Um, colloidal silver. Do you have to put silver up your butt? <laughs> well, this so-called treatment came back into vogue recently thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, where those willing to ingest bleach and horse paste gave it a shot <laughs> as a cure paste. for COVID. People like televangelist Jim Baker promoted a silver solution for coronavirus on his show, which, of course, landed him in a lawsuit. In May 2020, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration went to court to stop an Oklahoma company called N-Ergetics from allegedly touting colloidal silver as a cure from everything from the uh, coronavirus to... Yeast infections. What is colloidal silver? It's it's just basically silver that you ingest. 
It's a kind of silver that you ingest in like a liquid usually or a powder form. Oh, you're not, that doesn't seem like something you should be doing. No, it doesn't cure anything. Uh, more often, it'll turn your skin blue many times permanently. And eventually, if you have too much, it'll kill you. You know what? I've had some cheap silver rings and it, <laughs> it can, it can turn your skin blue. Well, babe, that's green. <laughs> you're colorblind, <laughs> but close enough. Opium. Uh, you're just making a statement now? <laughs> Made from the opium poppy. This substance has been known to us for more than 5,000 years, with ancient Sumerians calling it the joy plant, and the ancient Egyptians believing that the goddess Isis had given it to the god Ra for his headaches. Because even gods get migraines, I guess. Well, that was very kind of her, <laughs> and it's uh, uh, maybe presumptuous of the Egyptians to just steal Ra's stash. Eventually, opium made its way into snake oil products like Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, Godfrey's cordial, Jane's carminative balsam, or Daffy's elixir. You know, is it a snake oil if it works? Because I guarantee the soothing syrup that was just full of opium, it, I, bet, I bet it was soothing. Well, I mean, you're right. The main purpose was to put babies to sleep. <laughs> But sometimes it would forever. It would kill the baby. Oh, oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, our aforementioned friend Alexander Hamilton used the stuff for his own kiddos. Did he kill any of them that way? I don't think so, but he did recommend a little weak white wine whey, diluted brandy punch, or even a teaspoonful t or two of syrup of poppy to prevent restlessness and fits of crying till the breast tis forgotten. Till the breast is forgotten? That, may, that sounds like till they stop breathing. <laughs> I guess. Dover's powder came on the scene in the 18th century and contained opium, ipecac, licorice, saltpeter, and potassium sulfate. Okay, so licorice just to make it taste bad? And ipecac to make you vomit? I, it's, it's a wild mixture to me. It was meant to treat colds and fevers, but also could put people to sleep. Permanently. It would kill them, too. Oh, oh, oh. As creator Thomas Dover weirdly noted, some apothecaries have desired their patients to make their wills before they venture upon so large a dose. Encouraging. Uh, do the, uh, maybe, maybe I'm going to... You know what? We haven't actually... <laughs> money hasn't changed hands yet on this transaction. And before I fill out a will here at the medicine counter... <laughs> I think I'm going to consider alternate forms of treatment. Yeah. Perhaps the most famous snake oil is one that exists to this day. Yummy, yummy Coca-Cola. Opium? Ish. Has famous, famously has uh, coca in it, right? Mm -hmm. During the Civil War, Confederate Lieutenant Colonel John Pemberton became injured and eventually, as many soldiers did, became addicted to morphine. A pharmacist in his civilian life, Pemberton decided to capitalize by creating an alternative painkiller that would be less addictive. So he extracted cocaine from the coca plant, ah. mixed it into an alcoholic drink, and called it Coca-Cola. Cocaine was a regular ingredient in many medications of the time, including Roger's cocaine pile remedy and Lloyd's cocaine toothache drops, which were proudly marketed for use in dental surgery and with children. Boy, um, A, that's fun. And B, <laughs> uh, I guess I forgot that it was an alcoholic beverage originally. Yes, it was originally something like John Pemberton's French wine cola or something like that. Like it French was, wine cola. Yeah, it was like called a wine and then eventually just Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola itself does not, of course, still contain any cocaine. No, but don't they still get to import coca leaves for the flavoring? Yes, yes they um, have a, a agreement with that government to import the co uh, coca leaves and then they give the actual cocaine part, I guess, to um, medicine to, to create. <laughs> to medicine. To, uh, yeah, like, you know, medicine. Yeah, this is all for- To make like anesthesia and all that stuff, I guess. This is all for medicine and frankly, our whole board of directors is so sick this year. <laughs> uh, it did contain cocaine in 1886 when it went on the market. 
but by 1905, it contained only one four hundredth of a grain of cocaine per ounce of syrup. And by 1929, it was the Coke-free Coke that we love today. You know, and, and this is why, this is the problem with America today, Carrie. We're, get, we're, letting, we're letting these kids get soft <laughs> with their participation trophies and no hard drugs in their soft drinks. <laughs> To finish off today's show, I'm circling back to what I promised before, because I know everyone wanted it, the idea of bloodletting as treatment and how how deadly that this bit of quackery could really be. Um, Yeah, so so leeches and then eventually will you work your way up to just cutting people? Well, I'm going to go the opposite way. Okay, (laughs) please do. In discussing any kind of bloodletting, also known as phlebotomy, we have to go back to old Hippocrates and really any old timey doctors. Now, you may have heard of Hippocrates' theory of the four humors, but here's the gist the four humors are the main uh, four vital bodily fluids, which are blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Mm, they all sound so pleasant, I can't mm-hmm. choose. As I mentioned earlier, an imbalance of any of these was seen by Hippocrates as a sign of illness. And in his mind, are they all just kind of floating around freely in your body? Like you're a big sack full of them? I don't know. The balance of the four was absolutely key to health. And to achieve this balance when a patient was ill, doctors frequently turned to bloodletting, believing some illnesses were caused by too much blood or red bile. Other ways of purging the body and creating balance were via inducing vomiting or, you know, clearing out the bowels. But let's focus on blood, shall we? Greek physician Galen wrote about the benefits of bloodletting, declaring it the solution for everything wrong with the body. Everything? Pretty much. He was a big fan. Barber surgeons in ancient Rome and medieval Europe would often be the ones tasked with the job, responsible for both trimming hair and nails, and amputations, cupping, leeching, more on that in a minute, and bloodletting. A lancet, which was a curved or pointed blade on the end of a handle, would be used to cut into the body, often the upper arm basilic vein, and blood would be allowed to drip out. Now, how much was up to the doc? Uh, Though, remember that Benjamin Rush favored four to six pints at a time? Yeah, now they won't let let you give more than one at the... um, And even then, they're giving you cookies. At the blood bank. Yeah, and they give you cookies after. George Washington, who may have died thanks to his physician's aggressive bloodletting techniques, as we talked about, was bled of five to nine pints of blood before dying shortly after. Well, but if you're... If That's you're, so much of his blood. If you're cut from 12 down to three, yeah, there's probably not enough to pump around. <sighs> yeah. The notorious psychiatric hospital, St. Mary of Bethlehem in London, nicknamed Bedlam, utilized the technique in the 18th century to treat a variety of behaviors and conditions. One Bedlam patient, writer Alexander Cruden, wrote that the common prescriptions of a Bethlemitical doctor are a purge and vomit and a vomit and a purge over again and sometimes bleeding. And sometimes another purge and a vomit. Yeah, lovely. Lancets weren't the only things that were used to purge blood from patients. We're back to leeches. Oh, good. Leeches have been used in bloodletting practices for thousands of years, with the earliest uses of leeching to cure fever-borne illnesses and flatulence depicted in Egyptian tombs as far back as 1500 BC. To cure farts? Yeah. Leeches? Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to know where they put the leech. I'd rather have the the farts. (laughs) Leeches, as you may know, are basically born to suck blood. They love the stuff, and they have a blood thinner in their saliva that keeps blood from clotting and lets it flow freely. They also have three useful jaws and ten stomachs to digest their feast. So they're just little blood-sucking machines. I have a question before we get into the description of of the actual (laughs) leeching. Mm -hmm. Um, I know why ancient doctors thought this would work. Mm-hmm. Right? The four humors, they're out of balance. We need less blood. Less blood. Sure. Uh, why did they think it had worked? Do you know what I mean? They, mu- they must have seen evidence for that if they just, kept doing it I so long. I assume it's kind sometimes of just a coincidence. Just, yeah, sometimes people, people just, people get, just better. get better. Yeah. yeah. 
leeches were used in more accurate, targeted bleeding. So while a lancet was usually used on the upper arm, that's kind of its standard thing, in smaller areas like the temples or tonsils or genitals, uh, why leeches would be used. This isn't Game of Thrones. Oh, there was one really bad story, but I'm not going to talk about it, but it's just bad. This is our scary podcast. Why are you not going to talk about it? Uh, one doctor treated, um, I think it might have been gonorrhea, by putting 150 leeches on one guy's single tex- testicle. Like, just one testicle, 150 yeah. leeches. I gotta say, that's a troublingly large testicle. <laughs> well, I was thinking, too, like, is it like one after the other? How did that work? No, I'm assuming it means all at once. Yes, which... <sighs> but it must more or less be... They're not supposed to hurt very much, especially compared sure. to being cut. But like, ugh, ugh. Just the image of this man who ha- has a beard, a beard of leeches hanging down from his, from his crotch. Absolutely not. Leeches were also often reused, sometimes up to 50 times. This led to unintended and sometimes horrible consequences, like in the 1827 case where a leech was used on a syphilitic male patient, then reused to treat a child who contracted the syphilis. Yeah, this is why it's important you see those leech drop bins all over (laughs) the inner city areas. Um, You need to make sure people are staying safe out there with their leeches. Some patients did of course, died from too much leeching, including a two-year-old girl in 1819 who died of a hemorrhage from a single bite. Leeches were used for a long time, basically as long as it was believed that bloodletting was beneficial to health. Which was until when? Too recently. It was mostly a badge of embarrassment to have a leech bite, but during a short time when leeches were fashionable... In the 19th century. What is this? The year of the fistula again? They were even embroidered onto dresses. Like as a little, like, you mean a a logo. A leech. A logo of a leech. Yeah, like the little alligator shirts, you know, it's like a leech dress. (laughs) Leech by Ralph Lauren. (laughs) Now, uh, before we finish, I do want to emphasize that some well known treatments today sound like complete madness, but do really work. These uh, that I found are taken from the book Quackery, of course, and they highlight the thin line between valid and deadly treatments. So, Sean, I'm going to read what they are, and you're going to guess what what the actual thing is. You know what, what do I you mean? mean? What the actual thing is? I'm going to d- read like a description, yes. and you're going to figure out what treatment it is, or what, guess what it's supposed to treat, like what the condition is. No, like like what medicine or whatever it is. Okay. An extraction of the pancreatic secretions of a hog, freshly killed and injected into a vein in your arm. Uh, I've got, I've got nothing. This is insulin, a treatment for diabetes. Okay. So, like that sounds like a crazy thing. Sure, but, but it really does work. Sure, but I believe, but the hog, the pig has a lot of stuff in its body that would be helpful for <laughs> for in our body. An extraction of the oil from the skin glands of a sheep and applied to the eyes. Um, is, that, is it eye drops? Is it saline solution? <laughs> it is lanolin, uh, and it is a treatment for dry eyes. So I assume it is in eye drops. Oh, Jennifer Aniston had dry eyes. Even her friends didn't know. Well, they're s- squeezing some sheep oil into those babies, those baby blues. Boil the bones, ligaments, and tendons of a cow or pig and create a capsule from the resulting moisture. Fill the capsule with medical ingredients and swallow. That's just a pill. You're just describing a gel cap. Yes, it is gelatin used today across the field of general medicine. This one is crazy to me, but um, drink the urine of an impregnated mare. Well, I that think sounds like a witch. Craft it's a witch thing. cake, yes. <laughs> um, the urine of an impregnated mare. Mm-hmm. I got nothing. This is Premarin, and uh, it's a treatment for postmenopausal hot flashes. Oh, <laughs> this is mind-boggling just, that it actually works. Just high-test horse piss. <laughs> yes. Do they flavor it? I don't know. 
extract mucus from the intestinal membranes of slaughtered pigs or from the lungs of slaughtered cows and inject. I have to, I'm not going to know what any of these. This is heparin, a treatment to prevent blood clotting. Mm. So that's pretty wild, all of those. Yeah, they're all like animal parts. <laughs> but I mean, it's not any crazier than some of the other things we talked about. Yeah, I will say it is, they are not as crazy as heavy metals. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But who who first thought of drinking the impregnated mare horse piss to help with hot flashes, you know? Sure, and we do need iron. It's true. So, you know, tomato, tomato. Now, there are a few topics that are definitely in the quackery Venn diagram here, but they're a little too big for this episode. Uh, that's including lobotomy, which is like a whole thing. Um, Linda Hazard and her Starvation Heights Institute. Wait, so you're saying you want to do a whole episode on lobotomy? Probably. I think there's enough there. Um, there's radium and, and radium art and stuff. Mm. And there's, there's more. So don't think that I've covered the whole history of quackery today because there are some big topics still on the table. Radium. Now, Marie Curie discovered radium, didn't she? Yep. And she died from radiation poisoning? Yep. But then they continued using it in medicine? Yep. Well, that's weird. That does sound like an episode. <laughs> uh, we've also previously had a bit of, of coverage on the use of mumia or mummy powder in both medicine and art in episode number 16, The Curse of King Tut's Tomb. Yes, and we covered Mumra in episode <laughs> number 17, Thundercats. Stop. So check out that episode if you're curious about how Victorians caused a mummy shortage because they just gobbled up too many of them. Mm. Eating, eating mummies. So yeah, that's about it. Sean, um, what do you think is the worst treatment of all of these? What is the, the least, what thing do you want the least done to you? I mean, I, pr I, I really don't want like mummy salt on my burger or not, whatever. No, discounting mummies because we didn't talk about it today. Oh, it's drinking mercury. Just in any form. Yeah, because it sounds like it makes you puke and shit until you want to die. And then you might die. And then you might die, yeah. Yeah. Permanently, as they say. Yeah. Well, we could be grateful that medicine has made a lot of bold strides. But, you know, people 100 years from now are probably going to be looking back at us thinking how crazy we were for some of the things we do. What do you think sounds the worst? Is it the, the mercury toothpaste? Mercury's pretty bad. Any of that, like the arsenic. The old lace. Whatever is making your, your, your jawbone rot and your, your cheek be gangrenous so you could see through to your... That's not good. <laughs> that's, I would not like that. It's not good. No cheek windows. No. It's Lizard People Big World. Early the morning of July 6th, an explosion rocked the area of Elberton, Georgia, leading investigators to discover that a bombing had occurred at the Georgia Guidestone Monument, which was erected by anonymous patrons in 1980. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation confirmed that, after the explosion, the Georgia Guidestones were fully demolished. The Georgia Guidestones? Mm-hmm. This is a really, it's a big hit to conspiracists everywhere. These are a big, you know, big American conspiracy theory, I would say. Now, for those not in the know, and we still may do an episode on them, um, probably less likely now, but, you know, it's in, the, it's in the pipeline. Okay. The Georgia Guidestones are, or were, uh, an odd monument made of granite slabs with one in the center and four positioned around it. And then a capstone was laid on top of the slabs. The center pillar is carved in such a way that allows a ray of sun to filter through at noon every day and shine a beam on the center stone that indicates the day of the year. This That's monument, cool. Yeah. Well, this monument was sometimes referred to as an American Stonehenge. In June 1979, a man using the pseudonym Robert C. Christian approached the Elberton Granite Finishing Company on behalf of, quote, a small group of loyal Americans and commissioned the structure. Christian explained that the stones would function as a compass, calendar, and clock, and should be capable of withstanding catastrophic events. Yee. A small group of loyal Americans? Mm -hmm. It's weird. The stones have 
or had a variety of inscriptions with 10 guidelines or, you know, similar to commandments, including maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature and guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. So it's a monument to eugenics? There's eugenic thoughts in there for sure. These inscriptions were in a variety of languages, from English to Spanish to Swahili and Arabic. And naturally, due to their mysterious nature and strange commandments, they've been the subject of conspiracy curiosity for decades. Do people say that they're from aliens? I don't think so, but there's a lot of thought about the end of the world and, you know, eugenics, uh, eugenicism, if, if people are... Um, are thinking of limiting the population and stuff and whether that's going on in America. So in a statement covered by WSB TV two in Atlanta, the Georgia Bureau of investigation said agents found evidence of an explosion at the scene quote, the preliminary in- information indicates that unknown individuals detonated an explosive device at around 4 AM on Wednesday, July 6th. Elbert County Sheriff's Office personnel responded to discover the explosion destroyed a large portion of the structure. And from what I saw, it was at least one of the stones. Over the past few months, conspiracy theories about the stones have led to calls to destroy it. Uh, And these were spread in part by former GOP gubernatorial candidate Candace Taylor, who claimed the stones are part of a Luciferian cabal. A Luciferian cabal? Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's Satanists. Taylor promised her supporters that if she were elected, she would destroy the monument. (laughs) She wasn't elected to Senate, but it looks like she got her wish anyway. Well, maybe she's the bomber. Well, she's running for governor now, if anyone's interested. For her part, Taylor has responded to the demolition by tweeting, God is God all by himself. He can do anything he wants to do. Is she saying... That includes striking down satanic guidestones. Okay, so she, she's explicitly saying this was not explosives, this was God. <laughs> or someone working, uh, is God working through someone. Oh, she said God, can we <laughs> read it again? God is God all by himself. He can do anything he wants to do. That includes striking down satanic guidestones. There you have it. She seems like a totally level-headed lady that I would want for my governor. Now I want to know what the other commandments were. Um, okay, so I read to you the first two. Mm-hmm. Oh, those were top of the list. Yes. Um, so three to ten. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Okay, we, we already have Esperanto. <laughs> Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Balance personal rights with social, with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. So the, the, the last two commandments are both leave room for nature? Well, it, the last commandment, be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Gotta gotta say it double. Um, so, I mean, aside from the first two things, it's not too bad. But then the first two are like the eugenics stuff. So that's... Yeah, the first two seem problematic to me. But uh, the rest of it is... It certainly Pretty... doesn't sound satanic. Yeah. Wow. It might to, to some people. The Guidestones would generally attract 20,000 tourists per year. It's unclear if investigators have identified any possible suspects in the explosion or what possible charges they would face, though in my opinion, it seems likely that it may have been the work of the same right-wing conspiracy theorists who believed they were satanic in the first place. I'm not saying specifically Taylor, but it was a commonly held theory, especially in Georgia. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation... The Georgia Bureau of Investigation has said that for safety reasons, the remaining pillars had been completely demolished. So no more seeing those anymore. So every day the beam of light would fall on... That date. On a calendar. Yeah. That's kind of uh, cool when I want one. Well, you can't have this one. Uh, Mm. I just need guidance. Okay, but not that kind of guidance. (laughs) 
That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. We sure will. And um, come over and join us over there on Patreon. I want to offer special thanks to those already doing it. Our beloved top tier patrons are Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, Christy Atchison, and Ira. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe, music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. Ain't It Scary has been brought to you by Killer Podcasts and is a production of Longboy Media. Ohio is a land of mystery. From missing shipwrecks and lost treasure beneath her surface to strange phenomenon slicing through her skies. From myths that have evolved around historic events and people to the unsolved murders and disappearances that keep her communities wondering what happened. Find Ohio Mysteries on your favorite podcast app and let's explore the inexplicable. OhioMysteries.com. <laughs> <laughs>